Welcome everyone to What If Weekly, our weekly podcast recapping the animated series What If, the first Son delve into uh, cartoons with Marvel in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Aaron, we're talking about episode three. We're really kind of just jumping around. What did you think? I swear, everyone's tuning in and they're tuning right out because they're like, oh, this isn't the right podcast. <laughs> every week. Three second every week listen this. time. Uh, I, I have not watched a single one of those. You know, I didn't think you had, <laughs> and that's why I went yeah. with this one. Uh, the third episode's a real stinker. Can I tell you I about heard it? I, I read a headline that said like it was about Nick Fury and S.H.I.E.L.D., and it was real lame. Structured poorly. I think the episodes are only like between 20 and 40 minutes, and they could not pull off what they were trying to do. They were trying to do a murder mystery where the Avengers were getting killed one by one right before like before they could even become the Avengers. Maybe that's it. They left the what if as the answer to the riddle instead of telling you the what if at the beginning. Yeah, right. If that makes sense. Yeah, because you like go the first in two knowing episodes the what were, if. That's why you want to watch it. Oh, I wonder how this would go. Yeah, and this one, the what if doesn't come in until the end. Well, don't you appreciate the fact that they tried something a little different? But maybe it just didn't work. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. 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 So hopefully the writer no was like, that I got a great idea. Going. We're going to save the what if as a murder mystery. And everybody else was on board. And then when they saw it, they're like, you're fired. <laughs> everybody hates this <laughs> that episode. man no longer works. We're never going to try Marvel. this again. All right. Well, since you haven't seen it. Yeah, uh, sorry. Actually, it's something this about is it being Aaron. animated. It just has not grabbed me the way most of the Marvel ones do. It just seems like it doesn't really count. Mm -hmm. But I, mm -hmm. I watch a lot of animated I, stuff, so I don't really know what it is. Maybe that's not it. Who knows? The animation's good. The animation's very good. But uh, yeah, I'm in the same boat. It's something I'm watching, but it's not something I'm passionate about. Mm. Man. I, I have so many X-Men and Spider-Man cartoons from the 90s. Just keep watching. I haven't even got. Maybe someday I'll get to the what ifs. No, you said you watched the Spider Man trailer. Somebody recut episodes of the Spider Man animated series from the 90s to match the audio okay. of the trailer. Weird. And that was kind of fun. You should go and yeah. Google this, everyone. Everybody was in that show. And you don't realize that everybody was in that show. He yeah. interacted with Doctor Strange so much. Like they even had a Doctor Octopus cl coming out of a hole. Seeing mm -hmm. like it was pretty perfect. That guy had to have scoured hours of footage. To I just find finished that. watching the Spider Man 90s show. There's only about Did you? 60 some episodes, maybe like 60 episodes over like five seasons. Yeah, I just finished it. The, the last one is the, it's a mixture of the Clone Wars and Spider Verse before there was a Spider Verse. So the cartoon was kind of oh, the one yeah. that did it first. So they bring the Scarlet Spider in. They bring Spider-Man's armored suit he had for like one issue. Uh, they bring in a Spider-Man that has Dr. Octopus's arms, various other things. Uh, and then, so they, then they kind of mix the clone saga up with a Spider Verse kind of thing. And the Beyonder ha needs Spider-Man's help to save the universe, whatever. It's a big mix. But then there's a Spider-Man that has no powers and he doesn't even know why he's there. So they just kind of protect him and keep him out there. But then when they take him home, that Spider-Man's like, well, I don't have any powers just because I'm a normal person. I'm just an actor, and I want you to meet somebody. And then Spider-Man goes to his universe, and he meets Stan Lee, and he finds out that Stan Lee created Spider-Man, and it's this big thing where they are swinging around the city together. It's very weird. That's very weird right? and very meta. And he leaves, <laughs> yeah, and he leaves Stan Lee on a building like, well, see you later. And then Lee's like, well, how do I get down? Uh, maybe the Fantastic Four will be here next. And that was pretty much the end of the episode. They were really good at animation in the 90s. I loved the, like, I loved that show. Not every episode was great. X-Men was good. X-Men was great. And they yeah. really dived deep into classic comic storylines. Mm. Like, it was a great pairing with a comic book reader. Yeah. And like you said, they had everybody in it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that is Doctor Strange. Uh, here, here was what I think uh, from the trailer is it, it didn't seem like it seemed out of character for Doctor Strange to be so irresponsible with his magic. But at the same time, when, when his uh, assistant is like, don't cast that spell. And then he's like, OK, I won't like real sarcastic. And then he's like, OK, apparently he won't like nobody's fallen for that. And then he winks. I do feel like that was a take that they used specifically for the trailer. Because in the trailer, you have to get across the right feeling quickly. I bet if we watch the movie, he probably doesn't say it like that. They need to pull what they need to pull in order to make sense. But also, the trailer 
really wasn't that great, right? As far as Marvel trailers go, there wasn't a lot to it, and it was very street level. They're really saving a lot, I think. There's mm-hmm. a lot to it that they're saving that we're not seeing. So I think just based on what I saw, it looks pretty cool, but it definitely left a lot to, to wonder, like, oh, I bet there's even better stuff coming. I want to comment on the Doctor Strange thing, people saying that it seems out of character and that he's probably somebody else. They're just following the storyline in the comics Mm. where Spider-Man reveals his identity in Civil War and then he goes to Doctor Strange and asks him to have everybody forget. They really messed up Spider-Man in the the late 90s and early 2000s. It just got out of control. So yeah, he revealed Mm -hmm. his identity to everybody in Civil War, but then they also wanted to make him so he wasn't married to Mary Jane anymore because... Because uh, Casada, the vice president or whoever, edit- editor of Marvel, he just thought, felt like having Peter married all these years really saddled story options. Like they just weren't able to do things with him as a single guy like they used to. So in order to make him not married again, I think that was connected to everybody knowing who he was. But also Aunt May was dead or she was dying. But M- Mephisto, the yes. devil guy. He's the one that made a deal with him. Like, I'll save your Aunt May, but you have to not be married anymore. I don't know. It sounds really stupid when you say it. But that was the deal. And then everybody forgot who he was and to, like, reset everything. And they weren't married anymore. And his Aunt May was fine. But So he made a literal deal with the devil. But I don't, I'm not sure how Doctor Strange came into that. So that was the only part with Mephisto. Mephisto didn't make everybody forget his identity. Oh, okay. He then went to Doctor Strange said, can you cast a spell that would make everybody forget that I'm Spider-Man? And he actually, in the comic, tried to make an exception for Mary Jane. Mm. It was interesting. Yeah. And I read Spider-Man now. I'm a little fuzzy in between all that stuff, between like maybe 99 and 2005. I'm not really sure what the hell happened. But I read it now because I have Marvel Unlimited. And yeah, you know, he's just kind of back to what he was like in the 70s and 80s. Uh, Mary Jane knows he's Spider-Man, but... They're not together. It's pretty good. It's terrible. I actually just finished yeah. reading Superior Spider-Man, which went on through about 30 issues where Dr. Octopus was Spider-Man, you know, because he it's, he put his mind in Peter's body and he, would, he became the Superior Spider-Man. And it was really good. Like, he went nuts. He had an island, Spider Island, a communications place. He had robots. He had minions. They were all spider minions. And he had spider bots that were all over New York, always grabbing crime for him to, like, go around. Like, he definitely became the superior version of Spider-Man. But he became, like, such a law and order Spider-Man that everybody started turning against him. The Avengers turned against him. It, like, came to a head where, like, Octopus had to, like, uh, make a hard decision and he allowed Peter to come back and and live in his own body. And so he, like, sacrificed himself to save somebody else. Anyway. Like, I've seen a scene from that series just where uh, Green Goblin is confronting Spider-Man and he still thinks it's Doc Ock and he starts making fun of him. Right. And then Spider-Man says like something witty and then that's when Osborn, the Green Goblin, is just like, oh, it's you you again. (laughs) Right. Yeah, it all came to head because Norman had had, he he put together his goblin army, and then they were like a big gang of the Hobgoblin was there and all kinds of other goblins, and it was a big all-out war. And that was the moment Octopus realized that he wasn't the superior Spider-Man, and he didn't, and everything he thought he was doing right was just falling apart. So he let Peter come back and save the day. Just going on a big old tangent. This is all going to get chopped. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> no, it's great. We got to keep it all. I know. So, uh, welcome everyone to Aaron and Justin Talk Sequels, a podcast about movie sequels. I'm Justin. I am Aaron. And this week we are talking about Psycho 2, the Psycho, Psycho 3, Psycho. and possibly Psycho 4. We're not sure. We've been having an internal debate, everyone, yeah. about whether or not 4 should be considered a proper sequel. Uh, for two reasons. One more important to me, one more important to Aaron. It was a TV movie. And even though it still has Anthony Perkins in it, <sighs> TV movies don't feel like they count. And then it is also a prequel slash sequel in the same light as Mamma Mia and Godfather, where we jump back and forth between the present and the past. Mm. But we'll, we'll figure that out, and you'll listen because you love us. But first, we have to talk about Psycho, the original film. And it's the first time we've gotten to talk about Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah. 
in did my he do personal a lot opinion, of, uh, one of the greatest. Did he do a lot of sequels at all? He liked to remake his own work. Oh, okay. But I don't think he has any sequels under yeah. his belt. I mean, at least two or three of his films are remakes of films he made in the like 30s and 40s. It's, yeah. It's fun. And then how many of his films have had sequels made from them, like Psycho, or is it just Psycho? There could be other ones. Oh, I'm sure there's some low-rent ones out there. The sequel to North by Northwest, South by Southwest. Does Is it out there? It could be. North by Northwest uh, again. Vertigo 2, even dizzier. There actually might be a Vertigo 2, I wonder. Because it didn't seem like he kept a lot of his film rights. It doesn't seem like he cared too much about owning his own stuff. To me, he was on the outskirts with everybody. Everybody knew how great he was, but he wasn't ever... I feel like people didn't want to include him with the greats because he didn't mind working in TV, which everybody thought was a real step back. And yep. he just worked and worked and worked. He worked his ass off. I, I don't know. I just think he's one of the coolest uh, independent filmmakers, probably one of the, one of the first original ones. Especially with Psycho. Yeah. Made in 1960 based on a book. Robert Block. About a infamous serial killer, Ed Gein. Yeah. Um, I didn't know much about Ed Gein before, but now I know a little too much. I just knew the name and I knew that he was like a Norman Bates. It's hard to parse what information is accurate from which source. Um, And so I'm only going to repeat the stuff that I saw from multiple sources. Basically, a woman went missing in 57 from a hardware store, and they were just checking out Ed because he was the last receipt that she had before she went missing. And so the cops come to his house, and then <laughs> they find her head. Good Lord. I didn't <laughs> and know uh, then they found the head of a woman from who had went missing in 1954 that they had never found out. Mm. And then they just found a house of horrors because he liked to rob graves steal bodies that looked like his mom make masks out of their faces and then just create all sorts of common home utilities uh out of their bodies wow it was disturbing Uh, he is supposed to have uh inspired psycho the texas chainsaw massacre as well as the villain from silence of the lambs buffalo Mm -hmm. bob there there was suggestion that he was wearing he was building a woman suit out of the deceased women's body pieces but or skin but i've only saw that once or twice i saw some stuff like i watched uh the hitchcock movie that starred anthony hopkins yeah, hitchcock, and, right. and yeah and Scarlett it was Johansson. about him making psycho yeah they had some ed gein stuff in there and like they suggested that gein actually dug up his mom and i couldn't verify that anywhere hmm. sometimes um, these men come around and inspire so much of our fine 20th century <laughs> films and books <laughs> good job ed yeah yeah (laughs) ruled criminally insane he lived out the rest of his life in a insane asylum until he died in the 80s people were so incensed by his crimes that a cop actually lost his shit and started like punching him Hmm. and he had to be like removed so that like police brutality didn't come into the mix just good old-fashioned cop show kind of stuff and then like the house mysteriously burned down a year after he went away yeah you know that community was like yeah we don't want this yeah we don't want this around so yeah there's a book inspired by this Gein story about psycho the fictional story hitchcock loves it wants to make it his next movie after north by northwest his studio of choice says absolutely not that's trash he Film or he funds the entire film himself uh, between eight and nine hundred thousand dollars. It shoots over two months, and uh, he uses an interesting marketing strategy. They only premiered the film in two theaters, and it didn't even have a pr- proper premiere. Hitchcock used the strategy that I think many people know now, where they wouldn't allow anybody into the theater after the movie started, which really created a lot of word of mouth and there was other marketing techniques <laughs> there were recorded pa announcements at the theaters with hitchcock warning people that um there's extra security on hand to handle people that are so traumatized and run out of the theater and he put That's on a fun. big show the only way yeah. that hitchcock could that was the other thing like he was a, a self-promoter 
it, it always seemed like like here's this dramatic film I made, and now let me be a goof about the whole thing. Like I'll put myself in the trailer, I'll put myself on the poster, I'll have funny things to go along with it. He's such a weird guy. Such a weird guy. <laughs> and yeah, he he never won an Oscar. It's sad. He fe- it feels like he should have gotten more love in his time. But yeah, this movie stars Anthony Perkins and uh, George Clooney's aunt Janet Lee. Well, you're supposed that's to George stop there and say that's aunt. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, Janet Lee. She's got a famous niece or nephew. She or something. has a famous daughter. Oh, a famous daughter. Who would that be? Yeah. Who is that? Do you know who that is? Jamie Lee Curtis. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So this is Jamie Lee Curtis's mom as the star of the movie. And Hitchcock's rationale for locking the doors after the movie started was that people were advertised to see a Janet Lee movie. And if they got there late, they would never see Janet Lee. <laughs> <laughs> well, how late could people possibly get? I mean, she's in the movie for at least an hour. No, people it's show like up the to a movie half hour. No, it's like an hour. No, yeah, totally wrong. I bet no. you she's dead within twenty minutes. She's actually dead like within half mo- the movie. If it's, it's like it's around a two-hour film, and she's dead like in, within an hour. I'm looking it up. Anyway, um, so this movie did did a big thing and a thing that I don't think anybody had ever done before. They killed the star of the movie in the first half hour of the film, which is was absolutely unheard of at the time. But totally acceptable because her story was pretty boring. The story's fun. That's let's run down the plot real quick. So Janet Lee uh, plays a secretary in Phoenix called Marion Crane. Yeah, Marion. Who is having a secret affair with a man who's married and she loves the man and she wants to run away with him so she decides to steal a bunch of money from her company and run away but they make it so easy for her to steal it too because they're like oh here's forty thousand dollars can you go deposit that she's like yeah sure but she plays it off cool yeah she did and so she just runs away and it's very tense very hitchcockian we feel for her. We want her to escape. So we're nervous yes. whenever we see cops. We're nervous when she goes to buy a car with all cash and the guy's suspicious of her. We're happy when she gets to a hotel, the Bates Motel. This is where she meets a young man named Norman Bates, and he runs the hotel. And motel. he's very... Motel? Did I say well, hotel? It's, it's the, you keep calling it a hotel, but it's called the Bates Motel. I'm sorry. Motel. <laughs> what else happens before she's Well, I will dead? say it's it, it, the movie. The reason I don't say boring in a bad way. I just say that it, it feels because Hitchcock used his team from Alfred Hitchcock Presents his TV show. He funded yes. it himself, as you said, and he shot with his TV team. So the movie does have a very like this could have been an episode of Alfred Hitchcock presents about this woman who steals money and she gets found out by the police and it's over in an hour. And that's exactly how her story is playing. Gets the money. She leaves. She goes on this little road trip. She plays it very suspiciously when she runs into the cop, when she's buying the new vehicle. So she gets California plates. I mean, she's the worst. She's the worst uh, thief I've ever seen. It's just, it's just only leading to the fact where she's going to get found out. But then the movie shifts for the first time when she goes to this motel and there's this guy named Norman and he's just very weird. He's definitely a mama's boy. Uh, He's a little awkward uh, in front of women, especially. And they just have this conversation where his mother comes into it because she hears him and his mother yelling from that, from the creepy house that's up on the hill behind the motel. So she knows that he's got issues. I I wouldn't, I don't, I don't know if I'd say like their story parallels each other, but what he talks about how he feels uh, a little smothered, I guess, by his mother, um, but he doesn't want to admit it. And the way she feels, how she's trying to run away from life, it it basically is telling her, "I needed to go back, and I need to, I need to return the money and do the right thing." So that's kind of what all that leads to. And we get to the forty-eight minute mark because I was just looking while you were okay. Forty-eight, yeah. you know, it was around fifty. Yeah, it was around fifty. So you you won. So she's uh, in for half the film. Yeah. Yeah. And why is she only in for half the film? Because she takes the money, she gets back in her car, and she returns it, and then she goes to Sam, and they live a happy life together. Yep. And uh, that's it. No, the movie just, just kind of... What happened? Yeah. There's something that happened when she was uh, at the hotel. At the well, motel. Uh, <laughs> Norman Bates has a secret fetish. Where well, are we he... going to give that away already? I would say there's just a mysterious shadowed person that enters. Yes, okay, that's good. Looks Sorry. like a woman. 
a woman appears to enter While she's taking a shower. and cuts her to ribbons with a knife. Ring, 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 ring. Yes, very, very famous noise. Yeah, Bernard and, Herman, uh, very famous uh, composer. He's worked yes. in television. I think. I think. I'm pretty sure he worked on Alfred Hitchcock Presents as well. I think he worked with Orson Welles, like in radio and stuff back in the day. And maybe he was his guy that he brought in for like Citizen Kane and other things like that. I could be totally wrong, but I just know that the name Bern- Bernard Herman was composer for many things. But this is definitely probably his most famous composition. That shower scene. I'm not very good at composers. Like I. That's just what I just, know. I don't have a music ear, and so I haven't been able to fully appreciate it i don't think she's dead and that's sad i'm sure as you said i'm sure that was a huge surprise to audiences and probably the very first slasher film ever made by this mysterious person who looked like a woman but you're not really sure who it is you assume it's norman bates mother because there was no other woman there is a legend and i have no idea if it's true that alfred hitchcock bought every copy of the book psycho to prevent people from finding out what happens. Yeah, I read that he had his assistant go and purchase them all, but I'm sure she just came back with like 100 copies and was like, yep, got them all. Because she's got <laughs> shit to do. <laughs> she's not going to spend all day going to every bookstore in the country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being Alfred Hitchcock's assistant would be Oh, weird. that's madness. It's like Ozzy Osbourne asking his people to like only like take out only the brown M&Ms because that's the only ones he'll eat or something. <laughs> so after the murder, the camera goes pans back up to the house where we hear Norman say, Blood! Blood! Mother! What did you do? And he runs down and he finds her body and he starts taking care of it because he's covering for his mother. And we get to see the whole thing. They just show his whole operation. Oh, he's got to go get the mop. He's going to clean it up. He's going to walk around the room for an hour. (laughs) He's going to do... It's just very strange that we watch everything. But at the same time, Anthony Perkins is such a different kind of protagonist, antagonist, whoever he is at this point on screen that you don't mind watching him. Yeah, and I mean, let's talk about Perkins here for a minute. Uh, Not a very well-known actor in America, I think he'd only had a couple of roles under his belt. He'd done a lot of stage acting. Hmm. He'd done a lot of work in Europe. Yeah, I think he's a very successful actor throughout his life, but not a famous one, aside from Psycho. Yeah, he definitely worked. After Psycho, this is during the time when it was a little passe to be gay. Um, Passe, that's not the right word. Where, yeah, you just absolutely didn't talk about it. But Oh, yeah, he had to hide it or he would have been blacklisted for sure. Yeah, the funny thing is, is he was very open about it in the 80s. And I think he was only very open about it because he had basically done conversion therapy. Yeah. Is how uh, one of his playwright friends talked about it because his playwright friend was kind of pissed about it. Um, He had never slept with a woman until the 70s, I believe. And he started dating women after working with a therapist to teach him to like women and he had a couple of boys and like they lived happily ever after up until he died like yeah he married in like 73 and they were together ever since do you know how she died did you read anthony perkins's wife died on 9 11 in flight was it the one that crashed uh i don't think it was the one that crashed yeah you're right i don't think it was that it wasn't that one i think it was one of them that either went into the Pentagon or the Twin Towers, but yeah, Jesus. And I think it was the day before the 10th anniversary of his death. Something like that. Because he died in the early 90s from AIDS complications. Mm -hmm. Going back to this, he was hired on the spot by uh, Alfred Hitchcock once he started talking about how much his mother, uh, how attached to his mother he was, and how his mother would caress him and hold Mm. him. And cool. so Hitchcock was like, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, you got the part, bro. <laughs> That's cool. Don't need any more. Something I love about the internet, I like, I was able to read this big people article from like 83 talking about Psycho 2 and the press tour for it. He was just opening up about his entire life. It mm. was, I didn't think they talked about that stuff in the early 80s, but yeah, just very open about the homosexuality and all that. So he was very good for this role is where I was tangent. Yeah, it was like made there. for him is what it seems yeah. like. I can't imagine anybody else in that role. 
And... Oh, you know who else would have done a great job if only they had been born back then? Vince Vaughn. <laughs> Don't you think Vince Vaughn would have fed us? <laughs> Are we going to get into you that know, at all? You're right. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we should. So there's a, no, in the nineties, there's a shot for shot remake of psycho made by Gus Van Zandt starring Vince Vaughn and Anne Hache. Anne Hache. I mean, as far as experiments go, I don't know a major, a, ma- a major Hollywood film that they did a shot for shot. Like that was the thing about it is that, Hey, we're going to remake psycho exactly the way Hitchcock did with new actors. They added a couple of it things. It just seemed weird. Yeah, I don't even remember. And seeing I liked it. it. Like I did you? I remember seeing it. They were a little more open about the concept of Norman jerking off while watching her shower the first time. Oh, and then they have a little more nudity for Anne Hache in the shower scene. Was he was he masturbating while he was watching her? Was that implied? I I don't even. I just thought I he was think like was, checking her out. I don't think it was implied in the original, but in the reach. Cut one, yes, it was implied. Yeah, because 90s audience are not going to stand this movie unless he's jerking off while watching through a people. God, I kind of want to watch that now. That's <laughs> that's interesting. I've been doing so much psycho stuff. Um, uh, well, yeah, it would be interesting to see it now. So, yeah, he covers up the murder, and he goes about his business, and everything would be fine if not for that stupid affair she had. The guy that she's banging and her sister, Sam, Sam uh, and Lily. go to the motel trying to figure out what's up. And immediately yep. they know that Norman's kind of weird. Well, they go to the hotel. They go to the motel after uh, Aber- Abergast. Is that his name? He's the private investigator that Lily had hired, right? Uh, full disclosure, I did not watch Psycho again. I'm just going completely <laughs> off of memory. I've Jesus. seen it so many times. I, didn't I know you I have. You're, you're a big yeah. fan. Well, remember Abergast? He's the private investigator. I think he, Nope, totally Lily's, forgot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's really good. Janet Lee gets killed. Uh, Norman Bates covers it up, sinks her car and her body, and the money, by the way, because he doesn't know there's money in there. What, what does he care? In the swamp yeah. near the house. So the swamp's a, a, another big player in the whole movie, in the whole psych- psycho franchise, it seems like. Yeah, and then so like some time passes, like a week or something, and then her sister, Lily, comes to find Sam because she assumes that Marion had went to him because nobody has heard from her in a while, and, and the boss hasn't seen her. And, but he hasn't heard about it either, and that's where they meet Abergast, who's the private investigator that I think Lily hired. So then he's the one that goes to the motel to get some dirt, and he's like, Sam and, and, and Lily, why don't you guys hang back? I'll go talk to uh, Norman Bates. Or I'm going to go check out a bunch of motels, and that's where he finds the Bates Motel. Realizes because Perkins is so awkward and nervous that he starts to give it up uh, that she actually was there, even though he said she wasn't there. So then it turns out she was there. It's a great scene between him and the private investigator because Anthony Perkins, again, is so perfect in this role where he's his worst, his own worst enemy. Like, he's basically getting away with it, but then he'll, like, say something that the private investigator will jump on. Oh, well, you just said nobody's been here for two weeks, but now you just said there was a couple here last week? You know, things like that. So then he calls, because he wants to talk to Norman Bates' mom, but he won't let her up in the house. So then he calls Lily and Sam and says, she was here, your sister was here at the hotel, I'm going to go talk to the mother and get a little more information, because I think that the mother saw her. So then he goes into the house and gets murdered as well so the private investigator's dead is the private investigator the amazing scene where he's falling back on the stairs yes i love that scene so much another part of the movie in that there's um rear projection in the cars of course you know nobody drove for real in these kind of movies and when he falls back on the stairway they use like a rear projection thing too because they didn't really want the guy to fall down a stairway and get hurt yeah it looks super funny but it it's you know it works it works for the movie it worked so well there's a joke where hitchcock was out sick that day and that his wife did that shot but oh, really who, who knows if that's actually real <laughs> who knows who knows uh anyway yeah so now he's dead so that's why lily and sam go and posing as a newlywed couple or whatever and they go to bates motel to try to uh, get some evidence and then what else happens there <laughs> remind me <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it all comes to a head in, in that Sam goes and distracts Norman while she goes to the house. Can't find the mother anywhere. Finally goes down into the basement. And at the same time, Norman realizes that Sam has just been distracting him. So Norman knocks out Sam, runs into the house. Uh, Lily's in the basement, finds his mother in a chair 
But of course, because of his love of taxidermy, it's just his mother's body who was who's been dead for like 10 years and she's like been preserved pretty horribly. She, it's a pretty frightening scene where she turns around and she's mostly a decomposed skeleton. And then, twist. then Norman runs in dressed as his mother with a knife, all crazy, like ah, about to kill Lily. And then Sam is able to wrestle him basically to the ground. Everything dissolves and the police are now into it. And we wrap up the movie with the cops basically giving the audience all the uh, epilogue they need to understand where Norman was in his mind and how Lily and Sam are safe now. Uh, It turns out his mother died because Norman had poisoned her and her lover like 10 years ago in bed with tea. And then he dug up the body and pretended his mom has been alive this whole time, basically running his life. But she kind of, I guess, becomes him in a way. Like he has a split personality where he sometimes becomes his mother. And that's why he was doing these killings. So it really wasn't Norman doing it in his mind. It was his mother doing it. And then he would come back and cover up all the horrified. So there's been like yeah. seven or some people, most of them women, I think, because from what I was reading, which I don't really infer this too much in the movie, but they were saying it was like a sexual thing for him because of the way his mother mother treated him when he has an attraction to women now he must kill them that sounds right yeah i guess i sort of felt that i don't know and and the interesting thing i was watching this movie with my mother and with my mother <laughs> <laughs> no that is so weird oh that's the best <laughs> we're gonna cut we're gonna clip that and leave that no, as a audio preview that. no i was watching it with my wife oh and... your wife yeah, and she made a good point. And then I said, like, wow, this this final scene with the cops seems very unnecessary. Like, this is just a, it's just a strange to wrap it up in this way. But she was saying, you know, audiences in 1960 weren't used to this kind of movie. And to have them talk about him being, like, a transvestite and having, like, mental issues, feeling like he was a split personality, was, like, very taboo. So it was probably really interesting and also... Uh, a little nerve-wracking maybe to watch them explain this kind of thing and that's why i was talking i think i was talking to you over twitter over text or whatever that it reminded me of the hustler uh the the paul newman movie and that that came out in like 61 and that tackled like addiction which was like another thing that like i feel like american movies didn't really tackle so like that it was like the 1960s were like the beginning of these kind of movies where they were like uh, we want to talk about these kind of issues, mental mental health problems and things like that, obviously in, in very surreal and, entertain, and entertaining kind of ways. But like Hitchcock, Hitchcock was kind of like at the, uh, he was like ahead of his time, I feel like, with this movie. So that's why the ending works for me, even though it's just a big talker ending. Yeah, this is, uh, this is such a groundbreaking movie. We could talk about so many elements of it. Um, a simple one that the audience might be amused by is that this is the first movie to show a toilet in an American film. There you go. And the first film to have a toilet flushing in an American yeah. film. Uh, I mean, and these because... are things like censors would have uh, historically have said like, nope, can't show that, can't show this, can't show that, can't show that. Maybe it had something to do with Hitchcock funding it himself and that he like made the movie so cheap that I think it, it was able to convince the studio people to just release it the way he made it. And then it was, so he self-financed for a cut between 40 and 60% of the profits. And so it made 50 million in box office. So he came away with a bunch of money. It was his yeah. highest grossing film of all time. And it was until he died. I think he made six movies after this. I'd have to say it's probably his most famous film too. For all the things we just spoke about. Yeah, I think so. It's definitely just not because his Because of like the music film. and the shower scene and Norman Bates, all of that together, I feel like those are in everybody's head. Like everybody just knows about it, whether you've even seen the movie or not. And you know that Hitchcock made that movie. That's why I feel like this is probably his most famous film. What do you think his best film is? Rear Window. Yeah. I love that, that was... damn movie so much. But yeah, that's so good. He has so many. Rope is incredible. Lifeboat is incredible. Vertigo's good. North by Northwest. Vertigo's is good. Vertigo to me always feels like a little. It's a little over, overdone. I don't, what's whatever the word I'm looking for. It's just a bit much the way Stewart his acting is and how dramatic it's supposed to be. I think it's a cool movie, but I just think it's a little overwrought. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. I really liked The Trouble with Harry, uh, yeah. a comedy, and the first film that Shirley MacLaine was ever in. Uh, oh, okay. I'm slowly you know, Hitchcock building. was one of the original guys. Like he was, he was making silent films when he first started, mm-hmm. wasn't he? Oh yeah, 
And it was those like the are, 20s, I think. I think late 20s. 28 yeah. pops out in my head for some reason. I mean, it was definitely after uh, Chaplin, you know, who started making his, like, in the teens. Oh, but yeah. he was, like, a contemporary, basically, you know. When they were making their, when they were both making their, their big films, they were, like, right around each other. Or when Chaplin was making his film, his big films, Hitchcock was working. I just yeah, find that weird because yeah. they, they still, to me, feel like two different generations. But at the same time, they were pretty much in the same generation. But it's just that Hitchcock went on to do color. And that's something that <laughs> Chaplin never really, I don't think he ever he ever made a color film. Maybe he did. Well, I mean, he was kicked out of the country. So, I mean, he didn't really have much work. Yeah, but he, but in... like, you know, one of his last films was like in the 50s, you know, so he was making feature films at least from like early 40s to mid 50s and like anyway. hitchcock's heyday was like the decade of the 50s like that's yeah. when he really boomed so this is probably um, his last good one you said no no or his last great they, one no like it was his last film to gross as much as this one grossed but i mean there were still hits and uh, i've been slowly rebuilding my hitchcock library and yeah. i actually bought a couple that i've never seen i bought topaz and i bought frenzy frenzy i think that was the last one i saw was frenzy i think that's, that's the first very, one. that was like 70s basically I yeah think. i think that's the first one where he actually showed female nudity cool i mean yeah that's neither here nor there but um with <laughs> with hitchcock there's always a uh, level of voyeurism in his films like you see it all the time he was definitely interested in his leading ladies and the way they were presented. Mm. And so, yeah. Oh, the other thing about Psycho is that Saul Bass did the uh, opening credits, the animated opening credits, with the lines going across the screen. Saul Bass, he's like a famous title guy. He did a lot of famous stuff. He also directed one film. It was called Phase 4, and it's in the 70s, and it's about giant mutated ants that take over these two scientists. It's actually pretty good. You should check it out. That's, That's very interesting. <laughs> That's uh, very interesting. <laughs> let's wrap up Psycho with one last fact. Uh, Hitchcock mm-hmm. would constantly put the mother dummy in Janet Lee's dressing room to <laughs> mess with her. That's hilarious. <laughs> just, he was just that kind of guy. Oh, that guy. And oh, and and aside from the shower scene and the music, there's the two lines that are very famous too. Do you know what they are? We all go a little mad sometimes. That's one. And re 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 no uh, uh the other one would be one? a mother is a boy his mother is a boy's best friend <laughs> yes but yeah. when he says that you're just like oh my god this guy's troubled <laughs> <laughs> that was a uh, 1960s uh, psycho directed by Alfred Hitchcock and uh, I don't think I brought up any of my tidbits from the Truffaut book which is funny the entire book is an interview. It's just back and forth, him asking questions, Hitchcock answering, and just talking about the art of filmmaking. It's it's delightful. Francois. So yeah, yeah now we're he talking made movies too, right? Huh? Francois Truffaut. Truffaut. Yeah, he, he was. Movie. He made movies, right? He was a big French director. The famous. Yeah. yeah, we haven't really gotten into uh, foreign cinema in our lives quite as much as we probably wanted to at this age or by this age. By we? this age, we should have been much more storied. Yeah. I have seen a couple Fellini films. Yeah. I haven't seen any Kurosawa. That's another name they throw out there a lot. I've seen an Ingmar Bergman film or two. Seven Samurais on HBO Max. And I started watching okay. it one day and I realized it is more than three hours long. Holy shit. I turned it off. I've been watching um, uh, Godzilla, the original. Oh, really? Um, which is pretty good. But I, I can only make it like halfway and then I've fallen asleep, unfortunately. Yep. It's good. It, like it looks good, you know. It's a good film. Before it became all schlocky with the whole Godzilla craze, schlock, but, yeah. Like real, you know, they became real B movies. But when you watch the original Japanese film, you're like, wow, this is like an actual movie. It's hard to think of Godzilla as being like an actual, like Psycho. It was but, like an actual movie made by competent people. But then it became something bigger than itself, and then it just became B movie crap that they would throw out every couple of years. Yeah, no, I that. don't have anything artful to add. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't watched enough foreign film to even contribute to that conversation. I know. Yeah. I thought by by forty, I'd probably be well up on it, but. Eh. There's just a lot to watch. You know why? Because fucking Marvel Universe gets in our way every goddamn, <laughs> every week. I want to watch something. There's always some Marvel crap I got to fit into my schedule, too. That's like being on a diet. <sighs> like, if I want to have some chips, I got to walk that extra mile. If you want to watch a Marvel movie, you've got to watch that Kurosawa. 
uh yeah there's a new what if episode out there justin but you have you watched eight and a half yet <laughs> <laughs> once you watch that then you can check out the new what if that's what you it's very fair anyway uh psycho 2 we're back yeah we're yeah. back and we're talking psycho 2 the 1983 classic by Australian director Richard Franklin. I think it is a classic. Isn't that crazy? He was a student of Hitchcock. And yes. Isn't that cool to know, though? Just gave me a little bit more like, oh, I'm interested in seeing this. Yeah. And this movie was, oddly enough, written by 20-year-old Tom Holland. I don't know if this is part of the MCU. Where he I knew, I knew you were going to pretend it was going to play Spider-Man. And all I got to say is like all these people with all these bland names that like have illustrious Hollywood careers. And then some new punk comes along and plays Spider-Man with the same name. Now he's suddenly not cool anymore. He's suddenly like not everybody's cool going to confuse him. And he has to be the butt of a joke about this kid that plays Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. This the guy, guy went that... on to direct Fright Night, for God's sakes. Did you know that? Tom Holland? Okay. So you're saying illustrious? You ever see Night? Illust- no, I've never seen it. Is okay, it good? it's not an illustrious career, <laughs> but yeah, Fright Night's Fright Night's fun. And uh, he did something else. He did Fright Night, and he wrote maybe something else. Very cool. But so, yeah, so Psycho Two. Yeah, so Hitchcock dies. They're like, all right, let's yeah, start cashing. This is my in. favorite part of the story. <laughs> Hitchcock's dead. <laughs> now we can finally make things without pissing him off. Yep, like a sequel to Psycho, which doesn't really need one, but let's do it anyway. And uh, it's pretty straight up. It's set 22 years later. I like when they do the sequel that's 20 years later in real time, like with Indiana Jones. Yeah. In fact, like, if you go back in our podcast, you'll see a number of sequels that are done years after the original. I don't know. We've covered quite a lot of these, so it felt fitting that we would do Psycho 2. So I think it's the good way to do a sequel when there's a big gap, just saying. And... This movie is set 22 years later where Norman Bates gets out of uh, his mental institution because the judge rules him Mm. sane. And he, importantly, was never found guilty of murder because of insanity. Nowadays, we know what happens when a felon or somebody of this nature gets out of prison. They don't get to move back into their house. And there's a quote from Hitchcock that I really like, even though I don't totally agree Who gives a shit, and I'm paraphrasing, who gives a shit if it makes sense as long as the audience enjoys it? You don't have to... He was talking about it with Psycho. I think that's what I was trying to tell you last time we were talking about Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. (laughs) Yes, and that's why I said I don't totally agree with it, but I'm throwing it out here because he actually used that quote with Psycho and uh, why didn't the sister and the lover call the police earlier if they had this would have been more straightforward and Hitchcock was like this isn't a this isn't a documentary like it's not yeah. laying out the facts of the case we're trying to tell a mystery story yeah i'm cool with that what i'm cool with what he said as long as it's used appropriately and not just thrown around willy-nilly and that's what hitchcock did and that's what this film does too it doesn't just use the uh, it doesn't have to make sense as long as it's an entertaining thing here and there it just it uses it when appropriate The original Psycho is a murder mystery where we don't know who's killing these people. We think it's the mom. We root for people in different stages. We root for Marion Crane to get away with it. We root for Anthony Perkins to get away with it because he's just trying to protect his mom. And then it kind of just all unravels and we're like, oh, he's crazy. With this one, the director, being a student of Hitchcock, tries to do the same thing. He layers in a mystery pretty quickly. Perkins gets out of prison. He's his psychiatrist, played by the incredible Robert Loja. Love that guy who's really into his mental health. And he loves, I keep saying Perkins now, Norman. He loves Norman. And he gets him a job at a diner. There's been a guy running the hotel all those years while he's been in prison, played by the great Detective Sipowitz. Dennis, Dennis Franz. Dennis Franz. Dennis Franz. Yes. Yeah. And so Norman starts. Oh, sorry. I skipped an important part. At the hearing where Norman is freed, who's in the audience? But Vivian, yeah. was it? Here's a good callback. Vera Miles was Li- Lila yeah. Loomis. Yeah, sorry. I said the wrong Lila, name completely. Lila. Lila, Lila, Lily. I think I called her Lily in the first part. Sorry. Lily, I think is right. Yeah. Li- Lila? Well, it's got an A at the end, L-I-L-A. It's Lila, right? Yeah. 
So anyway, the same <laughs> actress. She comes back for this movie. Yeah. She's in the hearing. Yeah. She's got a. She's like, I got seven hundred names uh, that say they don't that are protesting his release. Nobody. Why doesn't anybody care? Blah 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 blah. blah. But they let him go anyways. Yeah, because the judge is basically like, "Ma'am, this is a Wendy's." You know, like it has no bearing <laughs> on the case that she went around and had a yeah. petition signed. Like it's a legal process. Yeah. Yeah. And he served his time. We find he's okay. So go ahead. Did you catch that she hooked up with Sam? Yeah. And they were she said my husband Sam, who's now dead. So that bitch. What? Her sister's dead, and they're both grieving, and they fell into each other's arms. It happens all the time in movies. <laughs> but he's a serial philanderer. He was cheating on his uh, wife with your sister, and then all of a sudden, like, he must have been very charming. He was charming. Yeah. You saw him. I know. Come I on. Know. He's working in his hardware store. Working <laughs> all good. He's got a good head of hair on him. Anyway, uh, yeah, so they hooked up. I mean, who knows when they hooked up, though? Right. Maybe they came back into each other's lives a couple years after the whole psycho incident. Yeah. yeah. Who, knows? who knows? Anyway, he's dead. But she says it in a way that I kept him in the back of my mind. I'm like, maybe he's the guy doing all the killing in this. Oh, <laughs> maybe really? Maybe he's not dead. Because I didn't know. Yeah, I, I didn't know. Maybe it was her. Maybe it was him. Maybe it was somebody else. I just was trying to keep everybody in mind who, who could be the killer in this movie. Because as you said, it's a real mystery. Yes, and the mystery this time is his mom, Norman's mom, even though Norman is sane now, has starts talking to him again. And leaving him notes. Yes, and they structure the movie in such a way where you don't really know who's doing it. He figures out that Dennis Franz is a huge piece of shit and that he's been renting out the hotel hourly for people to party. Motel. Motel. And, <laughs> okay, wait, no, we have to stop everything and settle this. What is the difference between a hotel and a motel? I don't know. <laughs> huh. uh, I'm thinking a motel was just what they called places that were on the side of highways and that people who were on road trips would stop for a night. And, and then hotels came about as, I don't know, more of a vacation destination place that you would actually stay at to be in the place you were at, whereas motels were just like a stop along the way. But I don't know, is there a difference? Like maybe motels are single story and hotels, anything that has more than one story. I don't really. Yeah, we could really Google difference. this and settle it. But instead, I'm going to ask no, our listeners. No, I'd rather not. I yeah. would really. I want our listeners to tweet at us ever know. <laughs> and tell us what the difference is between a hotel and a motel. Yeah. And I want to know if you're outraged. I just know that we home. do have to call it a motel because it's on the sign. Fine. It's a motel okay. on the sign. Yeah. Because I think motel stands for motor, like motor, motor in, so motel. So what does hotel stand kind of where it comes for? From. Hoder? Home. Home Like home. Motor tell? It's like a, so it's, it's a place you would, you would, it'd be more of a place to stay in for an extended period of time as your home, but a motel would just be a stop along your road trip, like your motor in on. I just made that up, but it might be true. I know. Look at us learning just on the spot. Anywho, mm. so he fires the guy and then he goes to work. At the diner, because uh, he works at a diner. diner. Yeah, because they had a set, they had a job set up for him. Robert Loja, his his doctor, Robert Loja, has probably one of the funniest lines where you were talking about what, stuff doesn't make any sense. Because not only does he let it go back to live in that creepy house, which is obviously going to bring back some bad memories for him, but he also says, "Ah, well, Norman, uh." Sorry about all these budget cuts we've been having that we we don't actually have a social service person come out here and check on you every once in a while. But yeah, you know, budget cuts, what are you going to do? Uh, anyway, if you have any problems, give me a call. See you later. But that was their way of, you know, covering up the audience questions of like, really? They're just going to let him live here and nobody's going to check on him? Just doesn't seem like a good thing to do. I don't know. But it did seem like the court had one thing right and that they were like, they set him up with a job. They're trying to get him back into society. So he's working at that diner down the street. And it's probably that same diner that... Norman had mentioned to Marion in the first movie when she wanted to get something to eat. He was like, well, there's a diner like 10, 10 miles up there. Do you think that's the same one? I think it is. I think it is too. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dennis Franz comes into the diner while he's working and starts just mm -hmm. fucking with Norman and fucking with the very nice girl that he meets that is working there named yep. Mary. Mary. Played by Meg Tilly. Yeah. Who is that? I feel like I should know who that is. You should know who that is. We just saw her... In another movie. Did we? Um, a couple podcasts ago. We did. Uh, she played another mysterious daughter in another... Indiana film. Jones's Indiana daughter? Rush, not too long ago. No. Indiana no? Jones. The Two Jakes. Oh. Oh, that's cool. You know, she was 
Faye Dunaway's daughter in the two Jakes. Uh, <laughs> Meg Tilly. I think this might be her. No, this wasn't her first film. So that's where I knew her from. I was like, oh, yeah, right. Meg Tilly. Right, right, right. One of anyway. the first times we see Mother leaving a note for Norman is a note is slipped onto the carousel where they pull orders at the restaurant. And they go out of their way to have Dennis Franz put his hand on there before they find the note. So it leaves it open yeah. that it's not that it's actually Dennis Franz messing with him because he's angry that he got fired. And then Norman meets a coworker, Mary, at the restaurant who's having problems with her boyfriend, and he invites her to come stay at the hotel in his own super creepy Norman way. Like, I felt for yeah. him. Like, he does not know how to talk to women. And Anthony Perkins plays this perfectly, and she be- they become friends, and mm-hmm. she starts living with Norman. And she certainly is doing things against her best interests, which seemed a little... They wrote it pretty well in that any reasonable person wouldn't go with this guy who was just released from prison for apparently killing... She just knew that he killed someone, but not a lot of people, I guess. But still, you would never, as a young girl, stay in this person's creepy house, right? But she does anyway, so you're kind of feeling like, really? But they kind of worked up to it, and they kind of made them seem like she really did trust him, and she wanted to be friends or whatever but then obviously we learned that there's a reason that she actually did go stay with him but i won't get to that yet anyway go ahead yeah like i mean along with that yes everything you said is accurate but the thing that was simple enough for me is they show at the diner that she's just kind of a dum-dum and you can just roll Mm. with it (laughs) no okay yeah well like yeah she's an 80s she's an 80s teen i guess that's might be how it is, you know. They don't, they don't, uh, they don't do smart things a lot in those kind of movies. Yeah, yeah. They just portray her as not very intelligent and uh, hanging out with bad people. So yeah, yeah. it fits. Do you know Meg Meg Tilly was married to Colin Firth for a couple of years? That poor that girl. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> very <laughs> weird. I, I just saw that out there on Wikipedia. And her sister's Jennifer Tilly. That's who is like the really squeaky voiced. Yeah, girl who you see in some comedies like The Bride of Chucky or something, right? No, no, I was going to say she had a great career in the 90s until uh, she had a tragic accident where a witch doctor transferred her soul into a doll and she was forced to do Chucky movies for the rest of her life. (laughs) It's terrible. And voice work. Yeah, that's all you ever see her in anymore. Nobody has seen her Mm -hmm. since then. Yeah, even Meg Tilly hasn't really, she hasn't seemed to do much of anything since the early 90s. Hopefully she wasn't murdered by her sister as an evil doll. Where are we? Uh, Dennis Franz shows up and uh, starts packing up his stuff, and somebody murders At him. At the motel, yeah. yeah. Because Norman fired him, yeah. yeah. And somebody murders him, yeah. yeah. Somebody murders him. People are starting to die. And how did the cops get involved? I love that this sheriff in this town who helped arrest Norman 22 years ago is all about Norman. He yeah. lo- he's really defending the guy, and I like it. It's a, kind of like a small town. Well, we look after our own around here, and even though Norman's had some troubles in the past, uh, we're willing to give him another chance. That's kind of how the sheriff takes it. But Robert Loja goes and to the to the sheriff's department because of their budget cuts. They just don't have anybody to look in on Norman. <laughs> so he asks the sheriff if he can take a keep an eye on him, take a look at him, and the sheriff agrees to. So that's kind of how the cops get involved. So it gives them excuse to stop over. So I think from here doesn't don't don't the two teenagers come in cuz there there was talk about like not only was Dennis Franz running like a prostitution slash drug motel out of the Bates motel and that's why Norman fired him but there was also like the house is being misused cuz like these teenagers would sneak into the basement have sex and smoke weed down there. Yes. So that happens now. Well, and Norman, they don't realize that Norman's actually living in the house. Uh, Norman is starting to renovate the motel because he's interested in it. Yeah. And he looks up at the house and he sees a woman in the window of his mother's house or mm-hmm. room. Yes. And it really freaks him out. So he runs up there and he doesn't see anybody. And then he hears his mother's voice from the attic, I think. And he runs up to the attic and then he gets locked in. Yes. Yeah, he gets locked in the attic. And, yeah. And so he, he's having visions and he's getting notes from his mother and he's hearing her. So he's he's feeling like he's losing his sanity. And while he's locked in the attic, there are these two teenagers that come for their favorite romantic hideout. 
yeah. in the basement of this creepy place and he starts feeling his girlfriend up they smoke a little weed someone comes in dressed as norman's mother and uh hacks the boy to death but the girl gets away and apparently goes to the cops and uh says you know my boyfriend was just axed to death in the bates motel house uh and i guess the cops come and check it out but they don't find anything so they're like eh, probably didn't happen young girl you just made that up <laughs> And then this is where uh, Marion's sister uh, gets involved, Lila, Lila, Lila. Yeah, Lila. She's asking the cops, why are you believing him? Why aren't you dredging the lake or the swamp? Mary covers for Norman. Yes. And gives him an alibi and says that he was with her all day. And so the cops just kind of pack it and leave. It really all comes to a head when... Mary is revealed to be Lila's daughter. Yep. So she is Marion's niece. And it turns out that Lila and Mary are trying, that the plan was to make Norman go crazy again or to look crazy and to, and to, to see visions. They would dress up as his mother and hide in the house and he would go back in a mental institution or something. Yep. Big twist. I don't think they were planning on people dying. But people are dying. So now you're questioning, like, well, is Mary killing the people? Is Lila killing the people? Is Norman killing the people because he's being taken over by his mother again? We're not really sure what's going on. Yeah, we don't know who's doing what. And all we know right. that is these people are hurting Norman. And now our sympathies shift back to him. Yeah, and Mary is going against her mother's plan and that she's actually feeling sympathetic toward Norman as well. She doesn't think that he is killing these people because he was locked in the attic. Like, who could be killing these people? Mary locked him in the attic while those kids were being killed. Yeah. So she knows that he didn't do it. Uh, there was just one kid killed. Oh, yeah, sorry. So Norman's losing his mind. He admits it to his doctor that he's been talking to mother and mother is back. And the doctor's all disappointed because he's so good. And he actually digs up mother, or Norman's mom's body to prove to Norman yeah. that she's All this happened dead. in one day. <laughs> yeah, it's been a busy day. <laughs> They're like, look, come with me. We'll go to the cemetery. I'll get some guys. We'll dig up the body. Here's her body. It was a pretty good uh, prop, I thought. Like, the dead body it was really good. And they took a close-up of it. I'm like, you got to take a close-up of that. That's some good work. Uh, so he comes to realize, yes, okay, my mother is dead. However, the person who's been calling me is telling me, that they're my real mother. Okay, so like we're all just sitting there thinking Lila's been really just messing with him. While this is happening, the cops dredge the swamp, find Toomey's mm -hmm. car and his body. Norman's getting more calls from his mother. He now knows that Mary's a rat and Mary's back there and she's trying to talk to him. And his mom calls and tells him that he should kill her. Because the doctor told, he figured out that Mary is Lila's daughter. So he told Norman, he, he's like, look, Mary is only here because she's trying, her and her mom are trying to make you go crazy. I don't think we're missing anything else other than it really all comes to a head at this moment, right? Yeah, Where everything. Mary, still feeling sympathetic for Norman, goes and dresses up as his mother and tells him, I'm your mother. Don't listen to the person on the phone that's saying you're your real mother you have to listen to me everything's going to be fine like i guess she thinks that this will be a way to take control of him and help norman out because she really wants to save him and at what point does he kill lila yeah before that lila is down in the basement uh going to dress up as the mother to mess with him again and then she gets killed like really this is like total slasher movie she gets a knife through the throat yeah or through the mouth into the back of her head. Yeah, so she's dead. It's very graphic. And yeah, then Mary dresses up as a mother. Yeah. Now, my question is, who killed the kid? It was Lila. She actually killed that young man? Yeah. Yeah? She would go that far? She'd actually kill somebody? Because he was locked in. I don't think she did. He was locked in the attic. It was Mary. Or Mary could have killed the boy, but it doesn't seem like Mary was into it. I just don't think any of them killed anybody. That's the where, where I was a little confused. That is... No, here's what happens. <laughs> what? We're getting ahead of ourselves. I shouldn't have asked that question so early because it all comes to a head. So Lila's dead because she was going to dress up as his mother, right? She's dead. Yeah. Mary dresses up as his mother. But that's when the cops enter and totally get the wrong idea because Mary is feeling like Norman's going to kill her, and she's just trying to play self-defense. But here she is with a knife, dresses his mother, so the cops kill her. Yep. They shoot her because he's all wounded. So now they save Norman's life, 
and the cops realize just like the end of the psycho we have like this cop exchange at the end where the cops explain what the hell happened and it in their minds it makes perfect sense norman is just this guy who had a rough life uh marion's sister lila and her daughter mary are trying to fuck with him and make him think his mom's alive they killed everybody but we know it uh and norman's gonna be fine now because we stopped them but what really happened is the end of the movie a woman comes to norman's house oh die emma yes emma (laughs) from the diner of course right yeah turns out she's his real mother his mother was her sister she was too young when she had him so her sister raised norman as her own but now you know having seen him struggle through life and go to prison and get out she made sure he got a job at the diner because now she feels like she wants to protect him and in order to protect him she's the one that's been killing everybody she's the one that killed uh to me she's the one that killed the boy in the basement she's the one that killed lila right those are the three murders i believe why did i forget so about his that real twist. mother i know isn't that funny his real mother is the last twist in the movie she comes over he gives her tea he poisons her and then he kills her with a fucking shovel which is a really violent scene at the end where he just bashes this old lady on the head with a shovel i'm like that was pretty did he really kill that actor because <laughs> it looked really good she's dead that was her last movie <laughs> um and then what does he do starts talking to her sorry he's drinking coffee no he takes her dead body and he puts her uh, in a chair and he treats her like the mother he always treated in the first movie and that she's now talking to him as this dead mother that he has and life resumes as normal for Norman Bates. That's pretty much the movie, right? Yeah, that was the plot. We really got deep there. Uh, The plot about this is the psychological unraveling of Norman Bates, who is fully healed by other people. Norman did nothing wrong throughout this entire movie. Everybody else drove him mad except he killed his real mother at the end it, well but by that point that. <laughs> he was insane again like he was totally yes, you're right he, they unraveled him yeah and so this movie is actually yeah. really sad because it's about a lot of people manipulating a mentally ill person into committing mm-hmm. crimes and so we are left at the end of this movie with norman bates as he was exactly at the beginning of the first movie isn't that a cool i just thought like this movie was pretty cool and that i felt the same thing too i was like yeah he was a murderer in the in the first movie and he went away and he got caught but if you do take it as the mental health thing it wasn't really him doing the doing the killings he wasn't in his right mind so the state healed him we were giving him a second chance but these people felt so victimized by him that they weren't letting him have that second chance and they effectively undid all the goodwill that that was that the state did for him in those 22 years I'm like, what a sequel. Even though it was a little bit of a silly 80s slasher film, it really actually worked. I was kind of impressed with it. Uh, Reviews at the time were mostly popular, but they all had a lot of the same themes. Somebody, One of the reviews said it's like they were robbing Hitchcock's grave. I think that's unfortunately where a lot of people were coming from is that they just didn't it's it's hard to accept that somebody would even make a sequel of a classic film yeah yeah Uh, but no like that review was actually a a positive they were like they were robin hitchcock's grave and we were (laughs) along for the ride basically oh so they said it as a positive thing yeah like (laughs) Like, hey way to way to do another hitchcock even after he's dead it's a slasher puzzle that you're trying to fix like it's reminiscent of hitchcock but it's not like I could see how it had a, had a good cast and and uh, Anthony Perkins came back to do it because I think when everybody read the script they were just like oh this is pretty good like this is a this is a nice addition to the story not needed but if we're gonna do one we might as well do this one and we don't want it done wrong so make sure we get the guy who was a student of Hitchcock we'll get the star back and we'll have a pretty good cast with Franz and and Loja and Meg Tilly I mean Loja. they didn't cheap out on it I wish they could have done it in black and white just to keep the style because I do think that. Uh, Franklin is that the director I think he has a very Hitchcock way of shooting Um, so a lot of the shots looked good and a lot of it was uh, it was an it was a well-directed film and if only they could have made it black and white but I'm sure that was a box office yeah that would have probably killed a starter you know yeah Yeah, they wouldn't have made nearly as much money but if you watch it in black and white I feel like it probably would it would look like a like a accurate sequel to Psycho there were a lot of homages to the original in there like is it this mm-hmm. one where they recreated a lot of the shower scene 
for when Mary yeah. is taking a shower. When she takes a shower, yeah. In this movie, of course, that was like a shot for shot. Has breasts in it. Yeah, yeah. Th- with uh, Norman peeking through the hole into the bathroom, but you know it's the '80s, so they can show whatever they want. I love clever camera use where it's clearly not Meg Tilly. Oh, did you see the Hitchcock shadow? I don't remember the scene, but yes, they did his profile. You know this famous Hitchcock profile he would use on his TV show. It was when he when he first goes into the, his mother's room and the lights are off. There's a shadow of him on the uh, on like a bed, I think, or something that's up against a wall. I'm trying to think of what my favorite part of this movie is. Uh, I watched this with my girlfriend this time, and I kept mm-hmm. checking in with her. Do you like Norman yet? And she kept saying, "No, he killed seven people." And I would just keep checking in. Yeah. Do you like Norman yet? Yeah. And eventually she was like, ah, those people are being mean to Norman. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I liked the most is the twist. I was like, oh, it's his daughter. It's her daughter. Like, I didn't know. I was like, all right. And then that helped explain why she was so okay with staying with this crazy guy. Uh, here's what it reminded me of. A lot of things remind me of this movie. It's Vincent Price's um, The Last Man on Earth, which was uh, Robert Matheson his story that was then went on to make uh, the uh, the I am legend he wrote that oh. that so they made last man on earth from it they made the omega man from it with charlton s and then they made the new will smith movie i am legend from that story so it's been made into a couple anyways so the vincent price one came out in the 60s i think the 60s but he's a zombie hunter basically he's the last man on earth and there's just they're actually vampires but basically zombies uh zombies have overtaken the world But he's out there and he's trying to find a cure and he's trying to kill them all. But anyway, the movie ends with him just being overrun by them. And when they finally kill him, it totally turns the tables. Whereas the young vampire zombie girls are like, are we safe now? And their mothers are like, yes, he won't hurt us anymore. Because the whole world is now not human. And here was this one human trying to kill them. They're just trying to live their life, even though they're zombies. And he was out there terrorizing them. So it just was like the whole movie you're on on Vincent Price's side. And then at the very end, but they're like, yes, he won't hurt us anymore. And now we're safe from him. It just totally turned it. And that's what this movie felt for me. And that, that that was the last twist I liked where you realized that uh, when she was shot down by the cops was like, oh, my God, they're the ones terrorizing him. <laughs> like he's just trying to live his life. And they and they were finally stopped and and thank thank God they they came when they did or Norman could have really been hurt. The the Will Smith movie did not end that way. No, it didn't, and that's what I think wasn't why it wasn't as good. They turned it into just too much of a zombie film. That they didn't give the zombies any life; they were just mindless creatures, basically. Yeah, I still really like that movie. It's a cool film. Yeah, I but like it, it didn't have a good ending. Mm-hmm. I didn't think. Just had your average zombie, or, you know. And ending where there was hope for humanity or something. Yeah, he, but yeah, he had not cured cool it, but then he died. The price one. And so I don't know if he had got the key. Now, the funny thing with that movie is depends on what version you saw. And they actually, I think they played, the version they played in theaters, he died. The version that they would then, you would see on TV, he lived. Did you know that? No. It has two endings. Yes. Those it's bizarre. sons of bitches. He, uh, yeah, in theaters I saw it, and he saves the girl and the boy and he lets them get in the protected like you know area where when once the lab blows up they'll be okay and then he blows up with the zombies but in the movie i saw in the version i saw on tv on tv he goes he gives the body to the to the zombies that they came for uh, the the girl zombie that he had and they all leave and they leave him alive and then he and the family or he and the girl and the guy are driving to the You know, the human area where all the humans are gathered in Georgia or something like that. One last, uh, there's one last tangent that I want to cover. Have you ever seen the movie Home? Animated Mm. film from 2015. I think so. It is the it's the guy from Big Bang Theory, right? Doesn't he do one of the voices? Yes, he is the star, and it's about yes, okay. An, I did see that, but I don't recall what it is exactly. It's about an alien race that takes over Earth in like a day because okay. they're always running away from a threat. And every time there's a threat and there's more than a 50% chance they'll lose, they leave and move to a different planet. So they're these adorable aliens mm. who are vastly superior technology, and they... 
just kind of suck all the humans up and plant them in Australia and give them all houses and they take <laughs> over the rest of the world. Wow. Australia's got that much space, huh? It made me think about that twist where it was, we always think about aliens invading and then we see the other side with the aliens invading and you like the aliens, even though the aliens have obviously have stuff to right. learn. It's a powerful thing for a film to do if they can change the sympathies. The movie does it again. Spoilers for the 2015 hit film Home. But the alien that they've <laughs> been hunting comes to Earth because they keep destroying every planet that they've been on. And it turns out it's just one starfish. And he's been chasing them because the dick aliens took a rock <laughs> from his planet that turned out to have all of his like future children in it. Mm. And so he's been merci- do not remember mercifully that. hunting or just merciless. Merci- he's been hunting them. Yeah mercifully yeah. Mercis- mercilessly yes. mercilessly yes that's the word i was looking for <laughs> that's the worst we don't know what we're saying so he's been hunting them and terrorizing them just to get his Ugh. children back so at the end Jesus. they give him his children Too back and he's happy but yeah it does that thing a few times where every nobody's a villain they're just approaching it from a different perspective if i've learned anything from ted lasso it's that the greatest villain <laughs> in our lives is ourselves <laughs> And not facing our own fears. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this is part one of our two-part Psycho series. Next week, we're going to talk about Psycho 3. And we'll continue the journey exploring Norman Bates' mental health. Uh, Until then, I hope you rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We're on all the social media. Come find us. We're at Aaron and Justin or at Aaron and Justin Talk, depending on the situation. I'm... I'm Justin. I'm Aaron? Maybe? And we will... Maybe. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, we'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.